Hello, everybody. I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the CEO of The Atlantic, and I will be your moderator today. We are going to have an incredible session. Star of the show is Nita Farahani. She is a futurist and legal ethicist at Duke. And she's so smart and so interesting. You're going to learn a ton. This is how it's going to work. We're going to watch a short video. She's going to come on stage and talk. And then we're going to do a little Q&A, questions from the audience. And that'll be a wrap. And you'll leave enlightened and excited. So first off, a video. Uh, it's going to make you see the future and understand a wonderful future where we can use brainwaves to fight crime, be more productive, and find love. Let's roll. You're in the zone. Even you can't believe how productive you've been. Your memo is finished, your inbox is under control, and you're feeling sharper than you have in a decade. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song. Sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen and notice a now familiar sight that appears whenever you're overloaded with pleasure your theta brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. You mentally move the cursor to the left and scroll through your brain data over the past few hours. You can see your stress levels rising as the deadline to finish your memo approached, causing a peak in your beta brainwave activity right before an alert popped up, telling you to take a brain break. But what's that unusual change in your brain activity when you're asleep? It started earlier in the month. You send a text message to your doctor with a mental swipe of your cursor. Could you take a quick look at my brain data? Anything to worry about? Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. You breathe a sigh of relief when the email she sends you later that day congratulates you on your brain metrics from the past quarter, which have earned you another performance bonus. You head home jamming to the music with your work-issued brain-sensing earbuds still in. When you arrive at work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails, text messages, and GPS location data, the government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. Now, they're looking for his co-conspirators. You discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, You've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking, you remove your earbuds. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. Everything in that video that you just saw is based on technology that is already here today. Artificial intelligence has enabled advances in decoding brain activity in ways that we never before thought possible. You've heard a lot about AI over the past few years. Here at Davos, it's been the talk of the hour. But I want to talk about it in a different way, which is the ability to decode brainwave activity. After all, what you think, what you feel, it's all just data. Data that in large patterns can be decoded using artificial intelligence. Consider this, the average person thinks thousands of thoughts each day. As a thought takes form, like a math calculation, you're happy, you're tired, you're hungry, you're elated. Neurons are firing in your brain, emitting tiny electrical discharges. As a particular thought takes form, hundreds of thousands of neurons fire in characteristic patterns that can be decoded with EEG, or electroencephalography, and AI-powered devices. In fact, what you're seeing here is my brain activity while I'm wearing a simple device like the one on the right. We're not talking about implanted devices of the future. I'm talking about wearable devices that are like Fitbits for your brain. 
It used to be that there was very little we could tell from EEG activity. But already, using consumer wearable devices, these are headbands, uh, hats that have sensors that can pick up your brainwave activity, earbuds, headphones, tiny tattoos that you can wear behind your ear. We can pick up emotional states, like are you happy or sad or angry? We can pick up and decode faces that you're seeing in your mind. Simple shapes, numbers, your PIN number to your bank account. It's not just your brain activity here that we can pick up. We can also pick up your brain activity in different places, like as your neurons fire from your brain down your arm and send signals to your hand to tell you how to type, move. All of that can be decoded through electromyography, and that's what you're seeing here as a device now in the form of a simple wearable watch that can pick up that activity. And in one of the pivotal acquisitions of the field, Meta acquired this company, Control Labs, in 2019 because major tech companies are investing in helping to make these devices universally applicable as the way in which we interact with the rest of our technology. In fact, the coming future, and I mean near-term future, is these devices being the primary way in which we interact with all of the rest of our technology. Rather than a mouse or a keyboard, you can simply swipe with your mind, move your hand more seamlessly when you're in VR or AR, use your brain as the way in which you interact with all of the rest of your technology, which is an exciting and promising future, but also a potentially scary one, a transformative one, one that will change the way that we interact with other people, and even how we understand ourselves. Let's take a look. Because it opens up new and dynamic forms of control. This is where some of our core technologies like EMG come into play. Neural interfaces, when they work right, and we still have a lot of work to go here, feel like magic. So if you send a, a control to your muscle saying, I want to move my finger, it starts in your brain, it goes down your spine through motor neurons, and this is an electrical signal. So you should be able to grab that electrical signal on the muscle and say, oh, okay, the user wants to move their finger. What is it like to feel like pushing a button without actually pushing it? And that could be as simple as, hey, I just want to move this cursor up or move it left. Well, normally I would do that by actually moving. But here, you're able to move that cursor left. And it's because you and a machine agreed which neurons mean left and which neurons mean right. You're in this constant conversation with the machine. This new form of control, it requires us to build an interface that adapts to you and your environment. It's an exciting future, a seamless future. It's a future that has already arrived in many contexts throughout the world, and especially in workplaces. So it turns out that one of the most compelling early applications of this technology is to be able to decode at least some simple affective states of individuals that can potentially improve their well-being, potentially improve productivity, but certainly transform what our lives look like in the workplace and in our everyday activities. While we can't literally decode complex thought just yet, there's a lot that we can already decode that's quite relevant for the workplace environment. Consider the fact that right now, many workplaces have individuals who have to be awake and alert at all times in order to do their jobs well. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Take this example where this trucker decided to take a 20-hour shot for a 1,500-mile ride, well exceeding the amount of time that any trucker, long-haul trucker, is supposed to drive. His employer didn't discover his choices until the fatal accident that was disastrous for the company and cost many lives. But he could have known much sooner. He could have detected whether or not the trucker was entering into the earliest stages of microsleep, starting to go from being alert to tired well before it occurred. And he could have done so through a simple hat, a simple wearable hat that has embedded electrode sensors that would pick up brainwave activity and give a score between one to five to help the employer and the employee know what stage of alertness the person was experiencing 
and whether or not they were starting to fall asleep. Now you might think, okay, we have driver assist technology in cars already, why do we need this? It's because this happens much sooner much more accurately, and it gives you the real-time information that you need in order to make choices to intervene before a person is perilously exhausted. And we as a society should want that. We should want a technology that enables us to be safer, to all be able to exist in an environment where commercial drivers or individuals who need to be wide awake are wide awake when they're supposed to be. Because when they're not, the consequences are disastrous. While plane crashes are much less frequent than other forms of accidents, at least 16 plane crashes in the past decade have been attributed to pilot fatigue. Which is probably why in more than 5,000 companies across the world, employees are already having their brainwave activity monitored to test for their fatigue levels. Whether it's the Beijing-Shanghai line, where train conductors are required to wear hats that have sensors that pick up their brain activity, or mining companies throughout the world, employees are already having their brain activity monitored, and it, may wear, it very well may be something that we want to embrace as a society. Okay, you might be shuddering, right? That was certainly my first reaction when I discovered that we are tracking brainwave activity in the workplace and that we can do it at all. But I believe we need to have a much more nuanced conversation about it. Because I think done well, neurotechnology has extraordinary promise. Done poorly, it could become the most oppressive technology we've ever introduced in a wide scale across society. We still have the chance to make it right. All right, well, does the same analysis hold true if instead of trying to monitor whether a person is falling asleep or awake, we decide that we want to monitor their attention levels to see whether or not they're paying attention and being productive. I would argue, maybe not. How many of you wear something like an Apple Watch? Fitbit, smart device? Yeah, many people. It's a many billion dollar company. I mean, many billion dollar industry at this point. Wearable devices, quantifiable self is just a widespread movement. Most people are very comfortable with at least some forms of human quantification. In fact, it's become so widespread that most people feel like there's not that much to worry about when it comes to doing something like monitoring your heart rate. But it turns out that that kind of technology in the workplace, particularly when it's used to monitor productivity of employees, where they're moving throughout the factory floor, whether or not they're taking breaks or unscheduled breaks, is the kind of thing that employees resist, unionize against, rise up against, and undermines morale. What we've seen consistently is companies from Amazon to Tesco to Walmart and others have introduced what is considered to be bossware or surveillance technology that employees really don't like it even if it makes their lives better. Okay, well if you don't like your job, just quit. But what if there's nowhere to go? What if everywhere has ubiquitous monitoring? In fact, during the pandemic, what we found was that 80% of companies admitted that they use at least some forms of so-called bossware technology to monitor the productivity of their employees. Whether it's a white collar uh, employee monitoring what's on their screen or in any other context, surveillance is part of our everyday lives. Surveillance for productivity is part of what has become the norm in the workplace. And maybe with good reason. Nine out of 10 employees waste time during the workday. They focus on other things. There may be good reasons why we want to be able to find better ways to monitor whether somebody is paying attention or they're doing something different. The newest way to monitor attention is through a device like this one. These are ear pods that are launching later this year. These ear pods, much like the video you watched earlier, are ear pods that can pick up brainwave activity and tell whether or not a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering. Okay, well you might think, fine, but even if we can tell whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, you can't tell what they're paying attention to. You would be wrong. It turns out that you can not only tell whether, whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, but you can discriminate between the kinds of things that they're paying attention to. Whether they're doing something like central tasks, like programming, peripheral tasks, like writing documentation, or unrelated tasks, like surfing social media or online browsing. 
When you combine brainwave activity together with other forms of software and surveillance technology, the power becomes quite precise. So what do we do with this? What do we do with technology that enables us to monitor brainwave activity for attention? Do we embrace it? Do we resist it? I believe that there is a pathway forward with such technology, but it's putting it in the hands of employees, enabling them to use it for themselves as a choice, whether or not they want to focus, whether or not they want the technology in order to improve their own performance, but not using it as a measure of their brain metrics to decide whether to fire them, hire them, or to watch for their lagging cognitive decline over time and using it as a way to discriminate against them. We might soon even use the technology to help people wake back up. This is a haptic scarf that MIT Media Lab has developed, which uses brainwave technology in a responsive way to give a person a little buzz, <laughs> literally, when their mind starts to wander to help them refocus and hone their attention. There's another pathway forward with this technology which I find to actually be quite exciting and something that I think companies should be experimenting with. And that is the use of the technology to make the workplace a more responsive workplace to the individual worker. We've all heard the whole idea that robots are coming for our jobs, that there will be no jobs left for humans. With generative AI, I think we have good reason to wonder how we're going to integrate that in ways that keep us relevant and challenged and important uh, in the workplace. But there's a different pathway forward which is a responsive workplace, one where humans and robots and AI work seamlessly together in order to optimize a better and healthier workplace. In one experiment, Penn State researchers were able to show that by monitoring brainwave activity with AI in a factory setting, the robot could sense stress levels in the individual and change the speed with which they were giving tasks to the human calibrating it so that rather than suffering from cognitive overload, it would bring it to levels of cognitive load. This idea of cognitive ergonomics is what I think is the future of the healthier workplace, a place that adapts to our abilities, slows down when we need to slow down, and helps us to reset so that we don't suffer from endless cycles of stress. In fact, Microsoft recently did a study on uh, employees during the pandemic. Using brainwave activity, they were able to discover a couple of interesting insights. One is Zoom-based or other video-based meetings are more tiring for our brains than in-person conversations. And this is because of misaligned gaze, because of also the way we've scheduled it. People do back-to-back -back meetings where you have five-minute breaks in between. They also discovered something else that's quite interesting, which is that the different backgrounds for each person is also more stressful for the brain. So they introduced together mode, which has the same shared background for each of the, employee, each of the people who are on the screen, which brings down stress levels, all responsive to brainwave activity. These are innovations that can make our lives better. So what's the pathway forward? In some ways and in some contexts, surveillance of the human brain can be powerful, helpful, useful, transform the workplace and make our lives better. It also has a dystopian possibility of being used to exploit and bring to the surface our most secret self. It threatens fundamentally what our own self-identity is in some ways and threatens to become a tool of oppression. But we can make a choice. We can make a choice to use it well. We can make a choice to have it be something that empowers individuals, that helps them gain insights into their own mental health and well-being, improve their own productivity and wellness, and sets them on a pathway where, like quantifying your heart rate or other kinds of health, it can be something that unlocks potential for humanity. We can't decode speech, and we may never decode full thoughts from the brain using simple wearable devices. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot we can already decode. There isn't a lot that we will not be able to decode in the coming days. As AI becomes more powerful, as the sensors become more powerful, more and more of what's in the brain will become transparent. I believe we have to start by recognizing a right to cognitive liberty. This is a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. 
It requires that we update existing international human rights like freedom of thought, mental privacy, and self-determination over our own mental experiences. But that's not enough. We have to do more, and corporations have to adopt best practices for the implementation of this technology. That requires being transparent about what data is being collected and for what purposes. Focusing on positive uses for employees to improve their work workplace productivity, increase safety, and decrease the burdens on individuals. We also have to be mindful of the changing landscape of biometric laws as this information becomes part of the workplace environment and decide to move forward in a way that is best for humanity, using the technologies and ways that enable us on a pathway forward, rather than oppress us. I think that's a possibility we can still choose. I hope it's one that you'll join me in choosing. Wow. I was monitoring all of your brainwaves and I could tell that you were all okay. engaged, though most of you were scared out of your socks. Okay. <laughs> is there any possibility, one of the things that's interesting, is there any possibility that this technology could work while not actually touching your skin? Right? Like right now, you have to make a choice to put on a headset or a hat or something in your ears. Is it possible that the web could have it in the ceiling? Um, no. Uh, not for brainwave technology, but it is possible to disrupt brainwaves remotely. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, you know, if you've heard of Havana syndrome, yep. Havana syndrome is a belief that people have suffered from. The leading theory is that it's targeted microwave activity at brains to disrupt brainwave activity. There's no proof of it yet, but there's at least a couple dozen cases where there isn't a good explanation for why the individual suffered from disruption of mental abilities. And there's certainly a lot of investment in trying to figure out whether you could target the brain remotely. It's much more difficult to figure out how you could read the brain remotely. Let's get to that, because I think it's one of the most important and crucial questions about how this develops. And by the way, raise your hands. I'm just going to ask this question, and then we'll move to the audience. You, you talked at the end, at the beginning, you said we won't be able to read complex thoughts. It seems as though we can understand emotions. There's some way you can recreate some images inside your head. Where does this, ex explain where we'll be in one year, where we'll be in five years, and where you would estimate we'd be in 10 years in the complexity of thought and emotional understanding that you can have from sophisticated brainwave readers. So, you know, I'm, I am a futurist. I'm not a perfect predictor of the future, but I'll give you my one year, five year, 10 year. So, Focusing in the world of wearable technology as opposed to implanted technology. And I do believe that within many of our lifetimes, we'll see healthy people using implanted brain technology as well. Then we can decode complex thought. But wearable brain technology, I think in one year, we will be largely where we are now, but with much better form factor technology. Yeah. So many companies are launching these earbuds and headphones this year that have sensors that are built in. One of the things that has limited the widespread adoption of the technology until now has been that you have to wear something like across your forehead. Most of us aren't gonna do that. But when it's the same device that you're using to take calls from and also to listen to music from that also is picking up brainwave activity, it's integrated into your everyday life. Because of that, the decoding will largely be in the same place a year from now, but as healthy people in a widespread way start to have their brainwave data collected, the insights that we can gain through pattern recognition will exponentially increase and pretty quickly. So five years from now, what we can actually decode will be massively increased from where we are today simply because we'll have a much greater data set from which we can actually create those correlations. Again, that's frightening but promising because think about most of neurological disease and suffering are those disruptions of brain activity which we'll start to be able to pick up. 10 years from now, even wearable technology I don't think is gonna decode complex thoughts, um, but it is going to decode a lot more. And already, gamers have figured out, for example, while person, a person is wearing a headset, how to you know, uh, prime a person through their brainwave activity to be able to decode their PIN number and their home address. So you don't have to have your full complex thought decoded to reveal your thoughts, right? It just it gets at what we think thought is. And how do you decode somebody's PIN number? You flash a series of numbers and see how their brain reacts to them? So you have recognition memory signals that are pre-conscious and subconscious, and this is part of why it's been used, for example, by governments to interrogate criminals. Do you recognize this potential co-conspirator? Do you recognize yeah. um, you know, this murder weapon? 
those pre-conscious signals, like what we call the P300 wave or the N400 wave, these are before you even consciously process information. So you could prime it with a number and then see if a person recognizes it. Um, and you can do it without them realizing that that's what you're doing. So will all of our passwords be cracked first by this or quantum computing? Hard to tell. <laughs> all right. I think uh, we're moving past passwords pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> and I it saw a hand go up. It's actually really good for passwords. Neural signatures are unique. We can use it as a biometric for passwords. Oh, wonderful. Right here in the front. Oh, and by the way, um, we need to get you a microphone. There are folks watching, so hold on. There we go. Uh, this is amazing stuff. Thanks. And there is a ton of need for government rule setting in this. Yeah. Um, not to be pessimistic on it, but having worked in government and seeing the number of things that government needs to try and get ahead of. Right. Uh, I am pessimistic that government is going to be on this. Yes. You know, if you were at, I mean, for instance, the World Economic Forum and you were speaking to leaders from across the globe right now, what would your advice be to them in terms of how to not F this up um, as yeah. this continues to go fast? Thank you. It's an important question. Um, so first of all, I, I think it's almost impossible to keep up with any kind of regulation with the rate at which the technology is advancing. This title, The Battle for Your Brain, refers to the book that I've written on the same topic. Um, and in it, I propose this right to cognitive liberty as a default starting place. That gives, I think, all of us a starting place for how to think about it, changing the default rules to give people a right to self-determination over their brains and mental experiences. We don't have to wait for human rights to be updated to operate as if we have cognitive liberty. And the way we do that is by recognizing, if we start by saying people have a right to freedom of thought, a right to um, self-determination over their brain and mental experiences, and a right to mental privacy, then when you're in the workplace and you're deciding to monitor, you're gonna monitor just for fatigue levels, even though you could capture and figure out, oh, this person has amorous feelings. You're gonna do data minimization and best practices that respect the autonomy of the, in autonomy of the individual. You're not gonna try to disrupt their thought patterns in order to make them more productive, recognizing they have a right to freedom of thought. And so I think it's about operating as if we have those set of freedoms and liberty in every way that it's rolled out in society. I'm speaking as a CEO, I'm sure all CEOs will use it completely responsibly. The woman <laughs> uh, in blue in the front here. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm one of the world, I'm the world's first online harms regulator um, okay. out of Australia. Um, and um, this was mind blowing, but you might have known that. <laughs> um, but I, I do think this is an issue where we can't leave companies to their own devices on these devices. Um, and there are principles like safety by design and privacy by design that are largely voluntary. But we just can't be sure unless there are uh, standards and regulations that um, these guardrails are going to be erected because we're still in the era of moving fast and breaking things. And I loved that you, um, you had the positive use cases and I was just thinking with the motor neurons and people who are disabled and could wear haptic suits and you could have sensation that you've never had. But I also work with women who experience technology facilitated abuse as a form of course of control. And most of that is low tech. It's, it's, um, it's text, it's love bombings, it's gaslighting. Think if a perpetrator um, got a hold of, um, can really coerce the brain. Yeah. So um, I, I, I do hope that you are calling for governments to, to think ahead and be anticipatory and start engaging, not, not to um, stop innovation, but um, to be responsible and ethical. Um, and I, I don't know that we can rely on companies in this distributed world. I wholeheartedly agree, right? So I, 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 I'm giving you the positive use cases because what I don't want the reaction to be is let's ban this, right? But I do think that the most important thing we can do is to start with a different set of default rules. And that default rule is the right to cognitive liberty is a right of individuals, is a fundamental right to what it means to be human. And that as a starting place for the implementation of the technology is very different than how we've thought about any other technology. But I believe that the brain is so fundamental to our sense of self and the freedom of thought is so fundamental to what it means to be able to flourish as a human being 
that unless we start with the default rule, it really could become the most oppressive technology that we've ever unleashed. I don't want that because I also think it can be the most empowering technology that we've ever realized if we do it right. But it's a call to action. It's a call to do it right now by adopting a universal right to cognitive liberty. All right, well, we are out of time. So everybody should go to dinner, go to the bar, okay. fight for your right to cognitive liberty. That's a wrap. Thank you to Nita Farhani. That was fabulous. Thank you Thank so you. much. Literally mind-blowing. Thank you.